A few weeks ago, I read a paper reviewing the vast amount of natural products derived from marine-based fungi over the last two decades. The paper mentioned how marine fungi were a significant source of rich biological activity, but that only a small fraction of the global fungal population had been studied. So I decided to take a trip to my local beach and see if I could find some marine-based fungi to take back to my lab for further isolation and study. When I went to the beach, I found several specimens of life that had washed ashore, including the seagrass. I know from my prior research that some marine-based fungi have been found to be endophytes, that is, they live within the tissue of plants. When I saw the seagrass with its roots exposed, I knew there might be a chance that there was latent fungi living within the organism. So I bagged up the seagrass in a sterile container and headed back home where I could begin processing the sample for further study. After cutting up a few 2-3 to millimeter sized pieces of the grass and putting them through a surface sterilization process involving subsequent washes with dilute bleach and isopropyl alcohol, I plated the pieces on a plate containing malt extract agar. After 24 hours, I noticed that one of the plated samples was beginning to show signs of growth. Tiny hyphae were emerging from one of the samples that were cut from the roots of the seagrass. After allowing the growth to continue for a total of 48 hours, I was able to isolate the species by transferring a small portion of the growth to a new plate. As the isolate began to grow, I noticed a few characteristics of this mold light fungi. It was beginning to produce a dark green, almost dark blue pigment visible on the bottom of the plate, and the mycelium was fluffy and aerial. But even after a week or two, it had not produced any canidia or other structures that could be used to properly identify it. This is where a tool called DNA barcoding can become quite helpful. By extracting and amplifying a small sequence of ribosomal DNA in the internal transcribed spacer region, or ITS, of the genome, we can compare the sequence with reference sequences of a known type from public databases such as GenBank, and we can make some reasonable conclusions about the identification of the organism. This works because this region of DNA is highly conserved. That is, it doesn't change very much over the course of evolution. The more two species are closely related, the more the DNA barcoding sequence will be the same or similar. Conversely, the more distant two species of fungi are, the more sequences will diverge from each other. Although I'm using the ITS region of the fungal genome to barcode fungi, there are many other places in the genome that can be sequenced to gain further certainty over a species' exact identity and phylogeny. And DNA barcoding doesn't just apply to fungi. The same process is used to identify and track the evolutionary relationship between plants, animals, and other types of organisms. In this video, I'm going to show you the process of DNA barcoding fungi from my home lab. As some of you know, I'm learning how to genetically engineer fungi, and one of the most common questions I get is, where do I start? Well, I started with learning DNA barcoding. DNA barcoding requires a baseline set of equipment and a variety of microbiology skills ranging from PCR, polymerase chain reaction, to using a pipetter, to creating dilutions of reagents, and so on. By learning DNA barcoding, you will expose yourself to a variety of foundational skills that will help you build a foundation for doing more complex science in the future. Over the next few videos, I'm going to take you through the process of DNA barcoding fungi using an isolated culture. This process involves extraction, amplification using PCR, and fungal barcoding primers, and finally sequencing and analysis. This video will cover the process up to sending the DNA to the lab, and in the next video, I'll show you how to actually use the sequences to identify fungi and how you can publish your own data to help future researchers. So let's dive into it. One of the first things I like to do is just to organize my workspace and make the tools I'm going to use easily accessible, like my pipetters here and pipette tips, as well as wipe down everything with 70% isopropyl alcohol. My pipette tip boxes had been sitting around for a while and um, the wiping it down just ensures that no dust that is accumulated uh, would contaminate my area. And uh, you don't need to build a flow hood as I have here. Plenty of people are successful without one, but I find it improves my odds of unintentionally barcoding a mold that might be hanging around my lab. In addition to wiping down the tube holders that will be in very close proximity to the samples we'll be preparing today, 
Um, I also like to uh, wipe down my thermocycler as well, since I'll be transferring the tubes to the thermocycler and to the centrifuge just right next to it. The first step in the DNA extraction process is to prepare a working solution of sodium hydroxide as shown here. Don't recommend that you touch it, but this gives you an idea of what it looks like. You can actually get this sodium hydroxide for less than $6 on homesciencetools.com. To prepare a working stock solution of 0.5 molar sodium hydroxide, we're going to take approximately 30 milliliters of distilled or deionized water, weigh out 0.6 grams of the sodium hydroxide, and mix it into the water. You'll note that I am wiping everything down as I go just to uh, lessen the chance of introducing contamination into the solution since this will be getting mixed in with the fungal cells. Um, note that once you mix it in or add the sodium hydroxide crystals, you will want to mix it thoroughly. And you will also note that it is an exothermic reaction, so you should feel the tube get slightly warm. Here I'm just going to label uh, the stock solution of sodium hydroxide and set that aside so that we can begin to prepare our stock working solution of TBE buffer. The TBE buffer that I get comes in a 10x stock solution. So to create a 1x stock solution of 20 milliliters, we're going to add 2 milliliters of the 10x TBE buffer and then use some deionized water to fill it up to a total of 20 milliliters giving us 20 milliliters of 1x TBE and uh, we'll also be labeling it and setting it aside. TBE stands for Tris Borate EDTA. The lower the temperature the more likely the borate will inevitably fall out of solution. So uh, make sure that before you use your TBE buffer stock solutions that you double check that they're thoroughly mixed. And if not, you can always pop the TBE uh, into the microwave for about four to six minutes to redissolve the borate. Here I have some pH tape just so we can do a quick check of the pH of both solutions. For the sodium hydroxide, we should expect that it is a strong base. And so here I'm just dipping some of that tape in there and we'll use this little chart to confirm that, yep, it is about a pH 12 to 13. We'll do the same with the 1x TBE working solution. And this should be at pH 8. and it looks right on the money. The next step is we're going to pull out some tubes that we're going to be using for the procedure. We need micro centrifuge tubes. Uh, again, I, I like to store my tubes in a shoe box here and then wipe down the exterior before I open it. This just again is just to help mitigate contamination. We will need uh, one tube for each sample. We're going to do two today. We're going to do the seagrass fungi and an aspergillus. And then we'll need one tube uh, for the PCR reaction. And then later on you're going to need an additional set of tubes uh, to send the PCR product to the lab for sequencing. But for now you can pull out two tubes per sample. I like to label them 1A 2A for the DNA extraction or template DNA tubes, and then 1B, 2B for the PCR product. This just helps me to keep track of which tubes are which. All right, and after a quick sterilization of the hands, we're gonna go ahead and start to prepare our tubes for the DNA extraction by adding 30 microliters of the 0.5 molar sodium hydroxide solution to our pre-labeled 0.2 milliliter micro centrifuge tubes. These are gonna be the tubes that we add the fungal cells to 
uh, to lyse the cells and release the DNA. Note that whenever you're working with the microcentrifuge tubes, it's a good idea to try to avoid touching the opening and just limit your uh, interaction with them to the lid, the top of the lid only, and that's just to mitigate the chances of a contaminant leaving your hand and entering the tube. Okay, now for the fun part, I'm going to take a pipette tip and I'm going to just scrape off a small amount of the mold from the top of the culture aiming for the newer growth if possible. And we're gonna take that small amount of tissue and add it to the first tube. And then I'm gonna use the pipette tip to macerate the cells within the tube. And I'm just mashing it in there and twisting it and pushing it up against the sides to try to break up the cells and increase the surface area for the sodium hydroxide to do its thing, break open the cells and release the DNA. Here you can take a look at what the solution now looks like. It has a slight tint to it, but mostly the cells have homogenized within the solution. So now that we're done with this sample, we're going to move it out of the work area and move in the aspergillus. Now aspergillus I find can be a bit difficult to DNA barcode at times, and one of the ways that I've had some success is to use the pipette tip to try to take some of the uh, non-sporulating growth around the edge but in this case it just wasn't enough so I had to grab a little bit of the canidia. As you'll see later this PCR reaction actually failed but at least you get to see one of the ways that I mitigate issues with difficult to barcode species. And just as before we're going to take that tissue sample put it in the tube and then use the pipette tip to macerate the cells. So one of the things you'll notice is that the extraction solution is darkly pigmented and I find that to be highly correlated with PCR reaction failure so that's something to keep in mind. Um, after we have put the tissue in the tubes we're going to let it sit for 10 minutes and then after the 10 minutes we're going to go ahead and add 150 microliters of 100 millimolar tris or TBE buffer rather and this is going to neutralize the pH in the tubes and facilitate the elution of the DNA from the fungal cells which have been lysed from the sodium hydroxide solution. The paper that you see down to the right uh, that I point to here is a condensed version of the full DNA barcoding protocol that I use. It just contains all of the various amounts that are used in the procedure. I'll link to it as well as the full protocol in the description. So the next step here is we're going to move those microcentrifuge tubes to the thermocycler where we're going to allow them to incubate at 95C for 10 minutes. After which we're going to centrifuge it for 5 minutes at 10,000 RPM or if you don't have a centrifuge that spins that fast, just extend the length of time that you allow them to spin so that all of the cell debris can uh, 
collect at the bottom of the tube and the DNA can rise to the top. And just a quick note about thermocyclers. This is one that I picked up on eBay for about $250, maybe $300 shipped. Um, pretty good deal. You should be able to find some on eBay. There are other options, open source alternatives that you can buy. Um, but it's important if you do get one, make sure that it works, make sure that it has a warranty and make sure, sure that you get one that has a heated lid. You'll notice that when I started the incubation period, the first thing that the thermocycler does is heat up the lid. And that's important to uh, managing the condensation that forms on the top of the lid that can have a big impact on the results of your PCR reactions. So we're gonna go ahead and let these spin down for five minutes, and then we'll move on to the next step, which is the PCR process. Okay, after doing DNA extraction, we need to make enough copies of the DNA barcoding sequence so that there's enough to actually sequence. And we're gonna do that using a technique called PCR. And this involves adding a forward and reverse primer, as you see here. And these are just small nucleotide sequences that sort of attach to the beginning and end of the fungal genome that we wish to amplify. So here we're seeing the primer, forward and reverse primer dilutions that I've previously prepared. And this is the 2X-TAC PCR polymerase enzyme that contains the enzyme that facilitates the PCR reaction, as well as free-floating nucleotides that are used in the amplification. quick note about storage here. This is a, a box that I use to refrigerate my primers and other reagents. You can keep them in the fridge for several months and they'll work just fine. Anything longer than that, go ahead and move them into just a typical freezer. All right, so shown here are the tubes that we use for the DNA extraction process. And I'm moving those to the rear because the empty tubes we previously labeled 1B and 2B are now our PCR tubes. I'm gonna move those to the front because those are gonna be the main tubes we're working with. The DNA extraction tubes are going to contain what's called our DNA template that will add to the PCR mix. So after taking some additional steps to avoid contamination by wiping down the exterior of the autoclaved water with some isopropyl alcohol, we'll go ahead and begin with adding 11 microliters of the autoclaved water to each of the PCR reaction tubes. Because of the size of the pipetter that I'm using, I'm actually going to be doing this in two steps. One where I'm adding 10 microliters to each tube and then coming back and adding one micro, an additional one microliter to each tube for a total of 11. And you don't need to worry about exchanging pipette tips here because there's nothing in the tube, so there should be nothing to contaminate them if you were to touch either of the tubes with that particular tip. Okay, the next tip here, what we're gonna do is set our pipetter to one microliter and add one microliter of the template DNA from the DNA extraction step to each of the PCR reaction tubes. As I said before, this is gonna contain the DNA that will actually get amplified as part of the PCR reaction. When I first started depositing one microliter into the tube, I found to be a little bit challenging, but you'll see at the bottom of the tube that little droplet, sometimes it helps to place the pipette tip against the side so that the surface tension can help uh, remove that one microliter, that tiny amount of liquid from the tip itself. 
Make sure to use a new tip for each DNA template transfer. All right, now it's time to add the forward and reverse primers. So you will want to use a new pipette tip for each one of these as well. And for the forward primer, we're going to add 0.5 microliters to each of the tubes. And for the reverse primer, we're going to use the same amount, 0.5 microliters of the reverse primer in each of the PCR reaction tubes. In this example, because I'm only dealing with two samples, I'm taking primer and tack mix directly from the tubes and putting directly into the PCR reaction tubes. But if you were dealing with more than I would say two samples, you would probably want to have a separate tube where you could add the total amount of primers, total amount of tack and water, mix them up, and then add them, uh, aliquot them to each of the PCR reaction tubes. That will help you save on some pipette tips. And the last thing we're going to be adding in our PCR reaction tubes is the TAC polymerase. And we're going to be adding 12 microliters to each of the tubes. And we're adding the TAC last because as soon as that enzyme gets added to the tubes, I've been told that in some cases your reaction can sort of start beginning, which is why after you want to add this at the end and why generally you will want to start the PCR reaction in your thermocycler um, as soon as you can, you know, within the next five or ten minutes, just don't leave it sitting around for a while. And after we've prepared the PCR reaction tubes with our template DNA, we need to mix them really well. Sometimes I like to put them in the centrifuge for a quick spin, as I have sort of shown here. And then we'll put them in our thermocycler, where I have actually pre-programmed this thermocycler to run a particular program, which you should be able to see. It is a 25 microliter reaction. The lid's going to heat up, but here you can see all of the different cycles that will be run uh, as part of this PCR reaction. And uh, so I'm going to walk away and let it run. It takes about three and a half hours. And then in the final step here, we are going to now do the gel electrophoresis step, which lets us double check that the PCR reaction worked so that we can uh, be sure that when we send our samples off for sequencing, that there is actually enough PCR product to be sequenced. And we're gonna start by creating our running buffer and the gel itself. To create 30 milliliters of TBE running buffer, we're going to add three milliliters of 10X TBE buffer to a 50 milliliter Falcon tube. And then I'm just going to fill that up to the 30 milliliter mark with deionized water to create the 30 milliliter 1x TBE buffer solution. To create the 20 milliliter 1x TBE buffer that we need for the gel, we'll just repeat the process, but we'll use two milliliters of the 10x TBE buffer 
and then we'll fill up a separate falcon tube to the 20 milliliter mark with deionized water or distilled water either one would be fine I think I mentioned this before, but make sure that when you are creating your TBE buffer solution from a stock concentration that you double check that your concentrated buffer is very well mixed. If not, you'll have some issues in running your gel, it just won't work, or even your PCR reaction could fail. Um, so just something to keep in mind, it's something that has bit me a couple of times and it's not something that uh, I would have thought of when I was going through the process and trying to troubleshoot the many PCR and jail failures that I had uh, when I was learning this stuff. So go ahead and mix everything really well. And the next step here will to be prepare our area for adding the agarose to our 20 milliliters of TBE buffer. The agarose is what's going to solidify and actually make this thing a gel. So we need a small scale because we're only producing or we're only creating rather a 1% gel here. That means we're only adding 1% agarose to the total 20% volume. In my case, I, I like to add a little bit less than the 1%, which is 0.2 grams. I actually like to add a little bit less because when you microwave the agarose gel solution in the next step, there's going to be a bit of evaporation, which is going to slightly lower the total volume of the gel and increase the agarose gel percentage. So you'll see that I'm adding just under 0.16, which again is less than 0.2 grams for a 1% gel, but um, it's going to work just fine. So after we've added the agarose to a small flask, we're now going to mix in the 20 milliliters of 1XTBE buffer. And gently swirl it, otherwise you're going to get dry agarose gel up around the edges. Kind of see it there. And we're going to pop that into the microwave to melt the agarose for 30 seconds. All right, after adding the, after microwaving the gel for 30 seconds, it should all be melted. The next step is we need to add DNA stain so that when we add the DNA to our gel, the stain will bind to the DNA and cause it to fluoresce. So in this case, we're going to add two microliters of 10,000 X gel stain to the gel. After it's had a little bit of time to cool, you don't want to add it right away. Wait a couple of minutes for it to cool. You can even use the pipette tip as I've done here to just make sure that all of the gel stain comes off the tip and gets well mixed into the gel. And after you've mixed it, you can take the gel mold here with the combs. I like to use the big combs because they're already small enough to begin with, but um, since we'll only have a need for just a few wells today. Let's use the large combs. We'll pour in the gel, use the surface tension of water to pull off the remaining liquid from the small flask, and then put it in a flat area where it can sit and set up 
And depending on the weather, it's a little bit warm in my house, so it takes a little bit longer for it to set up, but it should take about 10 to 15 minutes. You can check it by wiggling the comb and making sure that everything is nice and set up. And here we wanna just gently rock the comb back and forth to remove it out of the gel, making sure not to damage any of the wells that were created. The wells are gonna be where we pipette in our PCR reaction. Next, we're gonna go ahead and remove the gel from the form. And you'll notice that in this case, there's quite a bit of excess around the gel itself. So just take a paper towel and wipe off all of the excess from around the edges. Be gentle with it so that you don't tear or break the gel in any way. I'm using a blue gel uh, system here, but you could use really any electrophoresis system. This one's somewhat nice and affordable. It has some limitations like fixed voltage, but it works just fine for DNA barcoding. Once we have added our Cast gel, we're going to pour in the 30 milliliters of prepared TBE buffer, and you'll notice how I'm rocking it back and forth to make sure that I fill the wells and that there's just an even distribution of the buffer across the gel. But you would also notice that there was a air bubble. I like to get rid of that air bubble underneath the gel by pulling up the gel and then reseeding it. That lets the buffer get underneath there. And so now the buffer, now the gel has been cast and is ready for us to pipette in our PCR reaction product and DNA ladder. So I've taken a piece of tin foil and set that near the tubes. And I'm going to be taking some 6X DNA loading buffer. This is actually going to weight down the PCR product within the wells. And this is the DNA ladder that we'll be using. First thing I'm going to do is add five microliters of the DNA ladder to the, ex the exterior sides or the outside wells that will surround the wells that will contain our PCR product. The DNA ladder just gives us some reference bands. Uh, it contains a bunch of DNA of known size sizes so that we can compare our PCR rea reaction product size with that of known sizes to make sure that it worked. And on the left-hand side here, you'll see that I'm pipetting uh, four little droplets of two microliters of the loading dye. There's four here because uh, offline I went ahead and re-ran the reactions that you saw so that we have two of each just to rule out the fact that the filming process, which does complicate the preparation, uh, didn't mess something up. So I actually have two duplicates of each of the reactions that we ran today. One and three are the C fungi PCR products, and three and four, uh, sorry, two and four are the aspergillus. So what I'm doing is I'm adding five microliters of the PCR product from each tube to the little two microliter loading dye droplets that I created, and I'm pipetting in and out to mix them really well. As you can kind of see here, the pipetter. I mix them really well. And then I transfer them over to the well. So the blue ones, those are the DNA ladder that we added previously. And then the four in the middle are the PCR reaction products that we're going to be testing today. So once all the wells have been added with our PCR reaction products, we're going to plug in the gel box here, add the lid. Turn the light on and power it on and now the gel will begin to run and our DNA should separate so we can confirm the bands. Here you can see the reference for the ladder. This just shows you the reference bands that we can use to estimate the size of our PCR reaction product as well as the concentration. And this is the gel running. Notice the ladder on the end separating and notice that in between we have two bands indicating a successful PCR reaction. And then the two other wells, which are empty, are the aspergillus, which as usual, 
uh, failed. And so after about 35 minutes, we have enough of the gel run to determine whether or not it was successful. And we can see that the reactions for one and three were. And we can now prepare the samples for being sent to the lab for sequencing. And then in the subsequent videos, I will review how we actually order the sequencing, how we get the data back, interpret it, and publish the data. So that's it for this first video of the DNA barcoding process. I hope you found this helpful. If you have any questions or feedback for me, please leave me a comment or reach out to me on Instagram at everymanbio. I'd be more than happy to help you in whatever way that I can. See you next time.